Hello! Welcome to Free Will, Science, and Religion. I'm Chandler Klebs. I'm here with George Ortega, Mitch J, Michael Walsh, David Joseph, and our, and our new guest here, Daniel Meisler. And I want him to be able to introduce himself and present to, he has some stuff to present to us, some new ideas related to compatibilism. So, um, Daniel, hello. Welcome to the show. All right. Well, thanks a lot for having me. Yeah. So, again, my name is Daniel Meisler, and uh, I'm actually an incompatibilist like everyone else on the show. But uh, we thought it would be fun to do an episode where someone presents as a compatibilist so we can actually, you know, not have a whole bunch of incompatibilists talking about how silly it is to believe in free will. Uh, and instead, we have someone to represent, uh, you know, the other side. And I've sort of heard all the arguments, I think all the arguments, most of them, and I think I have some pretty decent compatibilist ones. And so for, the for you know, once we say go and pull the lever, I'm going to switch over and be that person. I, I want to make it very clear that I am an incompatibilist because I already get enough email as it is. Someone listens to it and they're like, well, you just haven't seen why incompatibilism is real. It's like, no, actually I have. We're just playing a game. Sounds so, good. Okay, let's let's start. Absolutely. Let's play devil's awesome. advocate. Let's do it. All right. I am a compatibilist. All right. So what are your uh, sort of main arguments, I, I guess, really high level for incompatibilism? Yeah, well, I'll just briefly mention that either due to causality, everything that we say, think, feel, or do is caused by prior events, prior events which stretch back to before our birth, before our conception even, and we're not responsible for it. And the other thing that people do is they throw in a causality or quantum randomness or something and say, well, if events are random, then we have free will. But that means we're not the cause of it. So either way, we're not the responsible first cause for anything. Therefore, no moral responsibility. Hmm. Uh, okay. Well, so I think you might have been arguing with some pretty unsophisticated compatibilists in the past. Uh, so l let me give you an outline of what a modern logical compatibilist position looks like. So basically, compatibilism means you are a determinist. Right, so I am a determinist. So I already know the things that you told me about, right? Um, I also understand that quantum randomness is like a dice roll and it doesn't actually give you any additional amount of control. So I'm with you there. Um, that That's not what concerns me because we all agree on that. That's why I'm a determinist um, or that's why I'm a compatibilist is because I am also a determinist just like you. The difference is that I think free will is compatible with that. Well, you don't. So, so follow me on this. When we live our daily lives, um, we have the, the, the option to be inconsistent and I guess to be hypocritical about how we behave, or we can embrace what we actually experience. Okay, so let me give you an example. Punishment, for example. Um, I, I imagine everyone on the show is what, somewhat... Uh, I'm guessing secular humanist, something along those lines, or uh, well, I'm a theist. This okay. No, no, no. Well, acutheist. No, no. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> George. George is basically. I used to be a pantheist. I used basic. to be a pantheist. I'm an acutheist now. Yeah, but it, but for the rest of us, how you described it, you know, is kind of sim simple. You know, we're secular, atheistic, sort of. We're certainly humanists. Yep. Yeah, I imagine that that's the case for most of us. So, so we we want to get away from retributivist punishment, right? We want to go more towards consequentialist, what whatever's best for the group, that sort of thing, right? Are, are we in agreement on that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and we also see the problem that free will, if you embrace it at a very primitive stage, uh, or, or the sort of primitive view of it, it's very simple. It's like you know, this person grew up in a bad household. They had a lot of bad influences, but they were given the option to do otherwise. Therefore, they chose the wrong option. Doesn't matter how the deck was stacked against them. God or some other thing gave them the option, and that's why they deserve retributive as punishment. 
right? So we can all agree that that's bad, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's the main harm that comes from absolute or libertarian free will belief. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. But unfortunately, you can actually be a determinist and still believe that we should hold people responsible. See, this is what happens is ultimately we have to build a criminal justice system, right? We have to build a system that uh, rewards and punishes. The question is only a matter of degrees, right? So, so here's the fundamental question for advanced conversation around compatibilism versus incompatibilism. What would you do different if true free will actually existed? How would well, you build a different society if absolute free will was true? I mean, Daniel, I think because our Supreme Court, for example, here in the United States has ruled that uh, free will is the law of the land. And because in general, you know, almost everybody here in the United States believes in free will, that's the system we have now. And so that's, so you get a lot of people, for example, you know, young kids who are from really disadvantaged backgrounds being punished and blamed and really, you know, it's, it's an ex extremely unfair system. I mean, like under, under the free will system, it, it's really hard to create a fair system. You, what you brought up before is like, you know, in terms of like, a system, because we have addressed this. In other words, like by eliminating free will, we don't eliminate responsibility because like, for example, we have a model in, in psychiatry where people are diagnosed, you know, with depression or social, um, um, you know, antisocial personality disorder and stuff like that. So like nobody in the medical profession blames them, right? But then no patient, no person diagnosed with this, you know, ever is led to believe that because what they have is not up to them, that somehow they're given like a free pass to do whatever they want. Yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah, Daniel, so, so like that, the answer is, I, the, the more direct answer to your question is like, you know, we already have that system, that, that it, it's an unfair system. Right, right. But that's, here's what I'm saying. That's primitive. That is an antiquated, crazy view of free will. That, that's like saying that the, and I don't remember, I think it was George, um, that your religious belief is the same as, you know, 12th century religious belief. There are gradations on the scale. Remember that I'm a determinist. Therefore, I know that these things are happening inside their brains and it's ultimately not their fault. I also don't believe in absolute free will because that's libertarian free will and I'm not a libertarian. So I'm agreeing with you about determinism. I'm also agreeing with you that our current society is structured incorrectly around the primitive form. But here's the question. So all of us are, are smart. Let's say we're philosopher kings and we're building a criminal justice system. How do we build the, the proper criminal justice system with an enlightened um, compatibilist view like I'm proposing or versus one where absolute free will actually does exist. So how is the, how is the punishment and the reward different? Well, I, I, and if they're if not I, different, then is, isn't that, aren't we just talking about the wrong thing? If oh, there's no, no distinction. It's, it's, it's very different. So I'm Mitch J. I'm like, the guy who first contacted you on Twitter. Nice to meet you, Daniel. Okay. Or nice imposter Daniel, I should say. <laughs> so you may be familiar with Greg Caruso, Greg D. Caruso. He, I've uh, heard the name. I, I, I'm not familiar, no. Well, he, for one, he is currently starting. He's part of an organization this, that is dealing with that issue, dealing with that issue of an alternative to, retribu to retributive punishment based on this notion of free will skepticism. Because of that, precise compatibilist argument that you are pretending to defend right now. The idea right. is, well, don't we have to free will? I mean, it doesn't important. We have, we, it's not that important to um, dissect the minutia of this issue. We still have to behave as if we have free will and it won't change anything. It does change a lot. As, as George is pointing out right now, we have different systems for dealing with the mentally ill, for example. 
No, no, those, right, right. And no, I agree that the current systems. hold on, hold on, Daniel, let him finish. Hold on. So ahead, why do so why do we have two different systems? If if you recognize that having a brain is the same as having a brain tumor, because in either case, the organism or the system of biological processes that we are calling the self, the person, whatever is constrained by that physical being. You're constrained by your biology. So when we see people through this light, through this view of free will skepticism, when we acknowledge determinism and, and realize that this idea of having conscious control is bogus, what's left to do, what changes, what really changes fundamentally in the world is that we treat all people like the mentally ill. All of a sudden, all we're doing is looking at the causes for behavior and trying to remedy those causes as opposed to saying, well, you need to wear the same orange jumpsuit every day and you're not allowed to have sex and yep. you need to be corralled with violent offenders and learn this violent prison subculture. All of that goes away. In fact, currently in, um, in Europe, particular, well, in the Scandinavian countries, for example, in, um, in Finland, I believe, and in Denmark, they've been experimenting for many years with new kinds of prison systems that are much more humane and much more compassionate. Uh, I mean, I don't want to monopolize the, the conversation too much, but we can also talk about another point that George alluded to. No, no, Daniel, no, respond, because, like, you know, we're going to do yeah. one, one thing yeah. at a time. Yeah, so we can talk about guilt afterwards. That's another thing. No, well, but but the problem is, I agree with you on all of these. Okay, I'm trying to do an exact example. Okay, let, let's say for example, um, I have my view. I'm a compatibilist. You have your view. We are going to do the exact same thing. Okay, I, I'm not. I, I'm not talking about broken, crazy compatibilists because I agree that's the current system that we have, and it's very broken, and they need to get. They need a lot more determinism in their lives <laughs> so that they can build a more just system. I, so I 100% agree with you. But watch this. Let's say let's say you have, you know, a um, guy who grows up around a uh, gang culture, okay? Poor family, like all the things stacked against them, you know, uh, cognitive abilities impaired for whatever reason. Um and there's some situation, he's 18, full of hormones, uh, someone challenges his girlfriend, wants to fight, someone pulls a knife, he pulls a gun, and at that last split second, right, he could either pull the trigger or not, he, make, he, he does the wrong thing, he pulls the trigger. Now, I'm a compatibilist. I believe that what this person needs is uh, rehabilitation. They had a bad life, they had all these things, they still did have a choice, okay, in, in the sense that they thought beforehand and they made the wrong one. But I'm also a determinist, which means I know that ultimately that was out of their control, okay? But I am building a system. We must build a system to reward or punish this person. And the, the person must be dealt with. And I, I would say we move away from punishment more towards you know, behavior modification or improvement, or uh, really it's about rehabilitation. Well, so Daniel, here's, what, here's what I'm proposing real quick. Okay. We will both build the Scandinavian system for this person. You and I will both build the Scandinavian system. We won't build the throw fruit at them because they're guilty system. So if we both build the same system, then how different are our positions ultimately? Michael, what's your take? I think Daniel does have a point. And that the, the hard determinist and the compatibilist, in terms of how they would restructure the criminal justice system, it would be virtually identical. They may have some slightly different motivations and a couple of nuanced points here and there. But ultimately, I would agree with Daniel that you're, you're essentially going to construct the same system. All right. So let me, let me present a case why it would be um, disadvantaged to create a, a free will based system like that because we are emotional um, beings. And to the extent that we continue this belief in free will, our emotion is gonna trump our reasoning. For example, that person that would, like, has a, a choice of, of pulling the trigger or not, if that person believes that the other person had a free will, he's much more likely to commit that crime. And then the, the, the police and the judges and the jury, because they have this emotional connection 
to this idea of free will, even though rationally they understand that the person's not responsible for it, their emotions will kick in and they'll tend to punish this person much more severely than is necessary, productive for society. Okay, I, I got a counterpoint to that. Their emotions will also kick in and say, wow, he came from a bad family. Wow, he's cognitively impaired. Wow, he's surrounded by losers who carry guns and want to kill people for gang signs. Um, wow, I, I feel compassion for this person for all the different pressures that are upon him. And it, basically, the balance becomes 99%, it wasn't their fault, 1%, uh, whatever, I'm a compatibilist. Um, and what's really the difference? And, and here, let me phrase the question slightly differently. And this is the way that um, my other compatibilist friend hits me, okay? He says, in a world where absolute free will is true or libertarian free will is true, how would I behave differently? How would I treat others differently? Um, as an advanced person, like you and I, me as a compatibilist and you guys, we are one, one, whatever, 15 zeros and then a one difference. We are virtually identical. Now, let's say there was true will or, or free will inside of the world. How would we behave differently? We wouldn't. It would be exactly the same. We would not suddenly switch if there actually was free will. We wouldn't actually switch to retributivist. We would still say, you know what, you made the wrong choice, but let, let's go ahead and uh, go towards rehabilitation, and hopefully you'll make the right choice next time. All right, but Daniel, so it would end up being the same. Okay, we already have. The, go ahead. Can, can I? Let me say something. I mean, okay. As Mike Walsh just said, you know, a few moments ago, it's possible that two people can have two different groups. Um can be instrumental in creating the same system and agree upon the same system, even though the members of one group have a slight difference of opinion, even a major difference of opinion, and might have different ulterior motives. However, what is our current goal? Our current goal is to change the way reality is now. I mean, you are you're speaking to... Um, you, Daniel, that is. You, you are referring to some a very particular compatibilist perspective that you engage in. You're saying these are these nuanced, sophisticated compatibilists that you know. From my perspective, all the compatibilists I've read about and talked with and spoken with, they don't seem to have a very philosophically consistent position. And they seem to go back and forth on the issue of what they truly believe in and how they want the world to truly be. So our goal really is to change the way things are now. One thing I know for certain is that if society as a whole and the legal system rejected this current notion of free will, it would have a completely different, uh, we'd have a completely different society. You are under this assumption that, like you said, you started with the premise that we adopt the Scandinavian society. Well, that's really the point. That's really, that's the, that is the real point. So when, when you skip ahead and say, okay, what if the world is already acting in a way that the free will skeptic would like? Well, that's a completely different challenge. I think yeah. the challenge we have in front of us is getting to that place. Perhaps yeah. after we get to that place, then we can have some really sophisticated arguments. I agree with you. I, I agree with you. Ones. Yeah. I agree with you that free will skepticism is a good thing. Because we are not dealing with these 11 compatibilists who have the advanced view. Exactly. We're dealing with the other billions who don't. So I, I agree with you there. So let me propose this, uh, this idea of a unified theory. Um, it actually applies to gun control. It applies to lots of different things. So imagine that a society, a given society or a sub-society, is in a certain state of free will, belief, and acceptance and sophistication. Then you have this, this input, which is um, free will skepticism or free will truth or reductionism or whatever it is. And it is a tool to be applied. Let's say that you're super, super Scandinavian, super secular humanist, and you already have virtually no free will in your belief system. 
we do not want to go to that family where Bobby comes home or Sven or whatever his name is. Um, he comes home and uh, he's like, hey, look, I got A's on my report card. And you go, no, Sven, you didn't get A's on shit. You didn't do anything. The universe <laughs> happened. Like 14 atoms bumped into each other and that A appeared on the report card. Go to your room and stop being such a prideful prick. <laughs> right? So that's one extreme. We don't want to do that. Now on the other side, you've got the other people who are like, look, you know, you had the option. You made the wrong choice. Therefore, burn in hell. Okay? So those are the two extremes. And, and here's the unifying theory. You find what someone is doing and you slide this bar according to what is needed to achieve a humanist goal. Well, Daniel, um, in a certain sense, we've, we've kind of presented the idea that like under the free will belief, you know, that that kid would maybe become boastful or arrogant or conceited, you know, especially if he's getting all A's, right? And, and you know, whereas like the father doesn't want to tell him like, no, it's just your neurons. It's not you. You know, the, the rational, wise and productive alternative to that boastfulness, the free will pretty much necessitates is the father tells the, the child um, that is excellent. You did really great. You should be grateful. You should be very appreciative that, that you were granted this ability that so many of your peers don't have. So it's a much it's a much wiser way. The, the, the kid still feels great. He feels lucky, but he doesn't feel arrogant. No, I, I, I love that. And I agree. But here's what I'm talking. Here's what I'm saying. That kid and the father will already be in the current configuration that I'm in, which means the distance between me and you will be infinitesimally small. So 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 basically, they're already going to believe that they're lucky. They're lucky to have the IQ. They're lucky to have the small community. They're lucky to have the, you know, tight knit community relationships and the government focus on education. So throughout their education, they've been told that's, that's actually why it, you, if you, uh, so this is crazy. When you interview these people, they believe in free will. Okay. But they built the Scandinavian system. So they already believe in the weight of circumstance. So when you say to this kid, you know, what do you, um, why do you think you got this? They're not going to be like, well, because I'm just smarter and everyone's dumb. They're going to be like, well, we need more education for everyone because that, that's how I got this. Now, let, let me give you one more anecdote here. So um, I'm switching out of the role, by the way. So this is me. Um, I, I'm in computer security. I, I do uh, a basically good guy hacker. Um, and when I talk about free will skepticism with some really bright people who have not been exposed to it, and I explain to them what incompatibilism is and compatibilism, like never heard the concept before. Like their eyes light up. They're like, wow, I never saw the world that way. And then they're like, well, and this is only a few people, some are com uh, incompatibilists, but I talked to this one guy recently and he's like, yeah, I'm a compatibilist. I'm like, what? Did you just hear what I said? He's like, no, no, I get that. I agree with that. I agree with everything you said. I'm like, no, no, no. But everything you just said, you had no control over. He's like, yeah, I get it. But I have to live my daily life. And the difference between what I would do if it were real and what I would do now, there is no difference. And that's what makes you a compatibilist. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, you already reached stage 9.9 .9 in 13 seconds where everyone else is stuck at stage two for their entire lifetimes. But once it gets to the 9.9 .9 versus 10, then we're all kind of agreeing. Um, and it really just becomes semantics, I think. Well, then, but Daniel, in that case, what's the point of being a compatibilist when, when by your definition, these compatibilists understand that, that free will doesn't exist. Why not just simply say it? But be, because they're um, because they're laboring their everyday life experience as that thing. So that's why I say it's semantics. They're simply using the definition of free will 
as the thing that allows life to move forward. But doesn't it confuse it? Because Einstein refuted free will, Freud refuted it, Darwin, they, these yeah. people, you know, like they were able to conduct their lives. I mean, I mean, we, we all know this, so this is preaching to the choir, but the, the real, there's, so there's a semantic issue, right? But then there's this other issue, it's wishful thinking. And I know exactly what you're saying. So the compatibilist, the nuanced compatibilist will say, I use my free will to pick the tomato. The free will skeptic says, no, you pick the tomato. You didn't use your free will to get the, to pick the tomato. Let, let, you let me give the you the tomato, but you didn't no. use your free will to do it. That's the. Well, but ahead. see, but see, how, how are we going to restructure our language for this? So let, let's go to um, self-improvement. Okay. I got a stack of books over here. I'm reading them. Why am I reading them? Okay. It, when you have a conversation with your friend, Hey man, Man, you, you should, you know, you should focus on your communication skills. Um, you should send clear emails. What, what are we, that makes no sense. Like, hey, man, here's the thing. The atoms inside of you, they should bounce into each other differently. Um, no, 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 no. But it, it does make sense because the reason it makes sense is because when you have a conversation, the, the way the physical universe works is that your friend, by conversing with you, is sending information to your physical brain, which may change you. We don't know what will happen, but based on this conversation, we know for a fact your physical brain will be different after that. It's all about determinism. Of the course. Books, the self-help books you read, although because of this ubiquitous free will belief, they make it seem as if you are helping yourself. In actuality, the book is helping you. The no. information from the book is going to have an impact on you. Absolutely. Which will Absolutely. change your, your course in life. Yeah. Absolutely. But within the context of behavior and experience, okay, the underlying conversation when you're helping your friend is try harder. Okay. It's use the information available to you to try and make better decisions in the future. So it's like, it, it's a pivot between being inside the illusion and seeing it for what it is. So, so here's what I'm proposing it is a way to behave as an enlightened person in free will, right? You, when you wake up in the morning, you say, I'm gonna do five minutes of meditation. Um, I'm not gonna skip it because I, I wanna skip it because I'm lazy. I'm also gonna do a set of push-ups, um, and I'm gonna do whatever it is my morning routine is and I'm, I'm going to do these things because they improve me and I want to be a better person. The, the whole context of that entire internal conversation or even an external conversation is within the context of the illusion. And that is fine. It's healthy. It's in, ex in the experience. The difference is if someone comes and says, well, yeah, of course you have a choice because God gave you one. Then you have to go, whoa, 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 hold up, guy. You understand that none of this is real, right? It's like, it's like, yeah, going to, I, I, I'm, not, I mean, I'm not a favor of promoting any kind of illusion whatsoever. I think, yeah, I think there's Daniel, an easy solution to that. I don't think right, that's necessary. The way, for example, we talk about computers the same way. We'll, we'll give the computer a choice, but we know it's not a choice. So in other well, words, Well, like, hold on, hold on. Another, okay, that's a good point, George. Another point, Mitch, is, it seems like given how, when you're at the store or at the cereal aisle and you choose quote unquote, Serial X versus uh, serial, you know, A through Z. Are you gonna are for convenience when we talk about doing things in the real world? Is it is it okay to simply say I chose to do this? I chose to do that. Do we always have to say, well, the atoms in my brain determined me to do this? Well, the atom in my brain. Is I, I think we can once everybody's on board. Do that. Do we this? have to get that literal about? Michael, that's a great point. I think like once everybody understands that nobody has a free will, then they'll understand that when somebody says, I chose this, they're meaning to say that the universe made me chose it, choose it. You know, I think it would be understood. But, you know, basically how else are we going to – otherwise we'll have to say, well, like, you know, like what, what do you – what – how do you even phrase that? Like you, you want somebody to choose between an exactly. apple and an orange. But you're simply saying – well, exactly. So the atoms in my brain determined me to have a glass of milk. You know, like that. No, no, you but have how, do you ask like that how do you ask a person exactly. to choose? So it, there's nothing wrong with simply using a free will terminology in everyday situations for the sake of convenience.
Right, but well, it's not actually even free will terminology because free will says I freely choose it. You're not asking somebody to freely choose between an apple and an orange. You're simply asking to choose. No, right? no. But, but see, check this out. Let, let's say you go to a, a play, okay, and you've been to a bunch of plays. They're not very good. You go to another play, and you're like, you know what? I, I just think this, uh, what is it, a playwright? Uh, whatever, the artist. I think this artist is just amazing. He's brilliant. That's a conversation I want to have. That's a conversation that humanists want to have. I do not want to have the conversation, you know, I, I just think this play right was really lucky to have, he chose his parents well, right? Well, he, we, he can be lucky to be brilliant. We can say he's still brilliant. Einstein was brilliant. He probably considered himself right. Brilliant. But but the conversation to have is to say that he was brilliant, not to say actually he wasn't brilliant. The universe happened. I don't see why there'd be any compulsion to say that. That doesn't mean, like, for example, someone could walk down the street and they're overweight. You don't have to go up to the overweight person and say, you're fat, you eat too much. You know, it's never necessary. I don't see why it's necessary to say everything at every given opportunity. No, but for, for a hardcore uh, skeptic, yeah. that, is, that, that is the inclination, is to, whenever you have praise or blame, to deconstruct it. Well, because but Daniel... Because yeah, they are actually not valid. But we recognize part of our philosophy, our understanding is that we are hardwired, programmed to respond to reward and punishment. And we're also hardwired to seek pleasure and avoid pain. So if there's someone we like who's done something really great and we want them to continue doing it, we're going to say, hey, you know, that's really great that you did this. That was really excellent. You know, even though they and we both know that they didn't do it freely, it still adds motivation. Yeah, um, I have a response to what Daniel's been saying, because here's the deal. We can still say of some scientist, mathematician, or musician, we can say this person is brilliant. Um, but that it, we're not saying they're not brilliant. What we're saying is it wasn't really up to them, the circumstances that made them so, and therefore they cannot be arrogant and think, hey, I chose to be a genius and everyone else can choose to be. See, that's the thing about that is then – people will realize that they aren't able to all be perfect geniuses. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think a really good point we could make is like nature, like when we show off in nature, right? So if I were looking at the Grand Canyon, I would say, oh, what a spectacle. What a beautiful sight to behold. Yep. Am I giving credit to the Grand Canyon? No. I don't have to give credit to something to appreciate it. I don't, well, I don't see why. I, well, I can say well, this is amazing. There's a brilliant person that exists. Fantastic. No, I, I agree. But the difference is with the human, when you say um, that's an amazing project, you are rewarding hard work. You are rewarding Am efforts. Re we, we still have to do that, Daniel, because, like, for example, with our economy, you know, in other words, like something who somebody who adds more value to the economy. In other words, because we respond to reward and punishment, we still need at least reward. You know, Mitch will explain how maybe we don't need punishment, but we still need inducements, even though, you know, again, even though we understand that they're not fundamentally up to us. Right. Th this is exactly my point. We, we are saying the exact same thing. So here, let me say it a different way. So as a hard incompatibilist, and as a smart compatibilist, we will treat this, this issue identically. We will speak as if free will exists. And the moment someone uses this concept of deserving either punishment or blame, we'll say, hey, dude, you're stepping out of line. That is not justified. That's actually harmful. And it's actually not real because we live in a deterministic universe. But if someone says, hey, Bobby, you did a great job on this. Um, your project was great. You're, it doesn't have to mean that they, it was an uncaused cause. Um, so in other words, you stay inside the language as if free will existed until someone makes a statement that, that encourages you know, the wrong thing to happen. Which is well, like, we're gonna right, Daniel. We're gonna do that under our position also. But like the the one I, difference is that the smart compatibil compatibilist position is superfluous. It it doesn't add anything that the hard determinist you know doesn't include. But what it does is it confuses the issue a bit more. 
In other words, like it gets people to believe that somehow we have free will, even we, though, we, though we don't. That's a confusing contradiction. Yeah, um, here, here's my take on it. My problem with compatibilism is that it continues to use the term free will rather than just dropping free and using will. Because will is, you know, real, that's desire. But the problem with the free will concept is it is it basically is saying that, oh, you were free to choose to desire otherwise than you did. That, and that's why I tend to disagree with using a term such as free will because it will give people that sense that, oh, they could have chosen otherwise. Another issue is honesty. Honesty is needed to solve problems. When you compromise rationality and you compromise honesty because you're operating under an assumption that in a pragmatic sense, the exact same actions will be taken, I think it's a very, it's it's not a very uh, prescient sort of thing to do. Because well, and it's also poisonous, kind of, right? Because yes. it can hang around and harm you later. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm exactly what I'm referring. To. So who knows? There is a difference. No matter how slight the difference may seem at this point, we can. We I think we all have a feeling. One of the reasons we push so strongly against compatibilist viewpoints is because this inconsistency. What? Sometimes it sounds like they're saying the same thing, and then all of a sudden, suddenly, yeah. it's not. So, right, Dan, so the danger is when does the when does compatibilism rear its ugly head? When does right, that Daniel? We, we've already gone like past thirty minutes. Well, let's go to forty, forty-one or so. But like you've been pretending to be a compatibilist, now present your real position that that basically answers the kind of position you've been presenting, you know, as a pretend compatibilist. Uh, well, I think we got there with your last two comments. So my, my argument against this position is that um, if it is, in fact, that close, which I agree with compatibilists that it is, in fact, that close, and that it's fine to use that sort of language, um, you don't leave it lying around. Um, it's, it's almost like, uh, and hopefully I'm not being as offensive to anyone who is religious, but when you have a holy book, sitting around that's 2000 years old and it's available and it has the reverence of being God given, then you could forget about it for a hundred years and then go back to it and it'll still have the same dumb shit in it and it will cause harm anew. So uh, it's basically a, a poisonous pill to allow this offering of basically truth avoidance this little, uh, it, it's basically false and you're allowing them to have it and then they could use it as a lever to add additional uh, stupidity into any argument. And this pivoting that, that you guys were talking about, I've seen it numerous times. I, I've seen it from this, this uh, he was actually my calculus teacher, uh, his name's Carl, uh, Super smart guy. He's my no, not a teacher. mathematician. No. Yes, he's a mathematician. No. That's that's the worst. Uh, and but and, but here's the thing. He gets confused sometimes. I, I see him say, "No, I agree with you, but there's no difference." So we're really saying the same thing. And I'm like, "Okay, cool. We're in semantics." And then he'll be like, "Well, we just haven't found the source of the free will yet." And because it's uh, an open universe and we don't know everything, you know, we have to err on the right, uh, on the side of it being there since we experience it. And that's when I just jump off the nearest building that I can find. <laughs> that is why I believe in unicorns. Fortunately, fortunately, Daniel, fate is with us, so it's just a matter of time. That guy's on the losing yeah. side. Well, here's, here's my big, my problem. When people say that we experience free will, I often like to point out that we really don't, you know, be, because we we experience that when we are uh, when we have a bunch of options before us, like the cereal, it's based on the price of the cereal, it's based on the nutritional content of the cereal, it's based on the taste of the cereals that we've tried before and know we like, and we're and I think that for the most part we're aware 
of the causes that compel us to choose what we do. So our choices are not up to us. But supposing that you are not aware of the causes, that doesn't make you in any more control. So that's the real key issue there is we don't experience um, a, a, a real feeling that it's up to us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I did an essay on this recently where um, I, I equate it to magic. So, or, or the experience of like God in your heart. So this is really cool. Let, let's say we're all atheists um, or let's say the whole world is atheists or whatever. Um, and someone comes and says, I just felt God in my heart. Now we hook them up to um, MRIs. And when they say they felt God in their heart, their body lights up like a Christmas tree. Now, did they or did they not experience God in their heart? Yes, they, they experienced, experienced it. They experienced God in their heart. Was God in their heart? Nope. So, so here's, here's another one. Um, magic. All right. Someone, David Copperfield, moves the Statue of Liberty. Did people in the audience experience that happening? Absolutely. Did it happen? No. So you have to break these into two separate pieces and validate each independently and say, you know what? You can have an experience of something without that thing actually being real. Let's not conflate the two. Great point. Free will is experienced as an illusion. Guys, yep. we're 40, almost 42. Chandler, why don't you end this like, and then we can like start the next one on, on the, the app? Uh, yeah, I just had one more response to what Daniel said was saying. He was basically saying there's a difference between our experience of something and what is actually happening. And I just think that's the thing that we need to keep in mind for future episodes. But anyway, I'll close this episode out. Okay, you've been listening to Free Will, Science, and Religion with um, Chandler Klebs, George Ortega, Michael Walsh, David Joseph, Mitch J, and D Daniel Meisler, is it, I think he said? That's right. Okay, yeah, and we've had a little bit of talk about compatibilism and what the differences are between compatibilism and incompatibilism. But anyway, it's time to end this episode and continue with future ones on different topics. So thank you for listening and goodbye.